which brings us to sort of the economics of health. Because obviously when you get high tech and all of this involved, there's a huge amount of money, trillions of dollars are already well invested into this myriad of uh, influences around precision health. And in fact, uh, biodata is now considered to be the new oil and it's called biocapital and it informs a whole new economy. And so, you know, what are you measuring? How are you measuring it? How are you sending it, sharing it, storing it? And then how are you betting on the outcomes of the interventions? All of this is essentially what's called the fourth industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution, steam engines, then electricity, then computers. And now the fourth is the bringing together of digital, biological, and physical systems. And it's largely driven by these four specific technological developments. So high-speed mobile internet, the, that, that's what this whole high-speed thing is, not because we needed to download our movies a nanosecond faster, it's because the amount of bio data that the whole new economy is built on requires five and six G transport, according to them. It also includes AI and automation, the use of bio data analytics, and cloud technology. These are key um, components of the fourth industrial revolution. And um, some of the terms are, you know, impact investing, pay for success, social impact bonds. The plan is to use human capital metrics as an investment market. And it is very uh, far down the road. I am not an expert in this. I am fascinated with it. I'm studying it. Um, but I have gathered the resources that have been most helpful for me. And uh, believe me, I plan on uh, getting into it more. But um, one of the, well, you'll see Alison McDowell and others, I'll, I'll talk about who I've subsequently been able to have great conversations with, um, know a lot about this. And it's really an important thing to pursue. So, the World Economic Forum is quite involved um, and speaks to this actually. And they say, um, in their words, that the new economy will change not only what we do, but also who we are. <laughs> it will affect our identity and all the issues associated with it, our sense of privacy, our notions of ownership, our consumption patterns, the time we devote to work and leisure, and how we develop our careers, cultivate our skills, meet people, and nurture relationships. They say it's already leading to a quantified self in healthcare models, and sooner than we think, it may lead to human augmentation. And you can see they are really excited about it, and it's one of the things that's very helpful in participating and listening to them is to see what, when they say they're optimistic, what is it that they're optimistic about? So I think I just cut, I just took these little clips here and there. I have all kinds of things to recommend for a more of a deep dive, but here's um, a gal from the World Economic Forum describing how excited she is about some of this new technology. One of the things that I think is so essential to free and open societies is freedom of thought. Um, and up until now, the conversation we've been having is around freedom of speech. Once we can access people's thoughts and access people's emotions, um, we have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts. So this is, um, you know, the notion that once we can figure out what everybody's thinking and feeling, then you'll notice that the conversation goes, good, then we can do this. And that whole idea that all of our thoughts and feelings will be tracked is really pretty much um, taken for granted in this, in this move. So getting this whole technological, medical, health, economic interface, I really wanted to know, you know, what, so what are the people into it thinking 
and to come at that really with an open mind and an open heart and not resist finding out whatever it was that I was going to find out. And who are the major people and companies involved in it? And how far along is this? And what's up? And there are many, many, many people involved, but I'm just going to touch on some of the top folks and especially where I've been learning a lot has to do with the, the collaboration between NASA, Google, Alphabet, and Larry Page, the CEO of that. Alphabet is Google's parent company. Uh, Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil. There are so many billionaires involved in this. You know, the SoftBank CEO, uh, Masayoshi Son, he's got $47 billion and is a big investor in this. They are funding research in the universities and major lobbying uh, with the government. So uh, in that group, um, these are some of the main people, and I'll talk a little bit more about them, and especially Ray Kurzweil, because he's, he's really like the godfather in Silicon Valley and an extremely influential person. Um, Kurzweil's been employed by Google since 2012, and he is currently the director of engineering. So this guy's very, a, a big influential guy, and of course, I'm sure most of you know Musk. So I'm just going to show a little thing from Musk talking about artificial intelligence and our biology, and then uh, go to Kurzweil, and, uh, and then I'll be back. Anyway, going, going back to the AI situation, um, like this is quite an important, uh, quite an important debate. Like the, if you assume any rate of advancement in AI, um, we will be left behind by a lot. Um, and so then, we could be in, you know, benign situation. But the, even the benign situation, if you have some, you know, if you have ultra intelligent AI, um, we would be, you know, so so far below them in intelligence that it would be would be like, you know, a pet. Basically. Pet. That's what I was thinking. Like a pet. Cat. Like a cat. cat. Like a cat. Elon it'd be like the a house cat. cat. Yeah, right. it would be like the house cat. Right. Well, it's a philosophical issue as to whether. Uh, this is still human. Uh, in my mind, it's definitely going beyond biology. But I don't define human as just biological. I mean, we're already taking steps beyond biology. There's not a single organ in the human body, including regions of the brain, where we're not already creating substitutes or extensions or augmentations. Uh, so if somebody has a, an artificial pancreas, is, are they not human? If they have a neural implant in their brain, are they not human? How about two neural implants? Or maybe you can have up to 10, then you're human, but 11, you're not human anymore. If you have these nanobots, blood cell size robots in the brain that are actually have computers interacting with your biological neurons, is that still a human? Well, one nanobot's probably okay. How about 500 million nanobots? So uh, I have listed some videos that I recommend uh, that will show up in the show notes, but I wanted to note that these are very significant players uh, and what they're talking about uh, has to do with this confluence of technology and biology and which as i said has uh, obviously many risks and and some advantages so the thing about kurzweil this major player in silicon valley and really globally but he is known as a futurist and he's done a lot, made a lot of predictions. He's, he's actually known for his uh, predictions, which uh, he's won all kinds of awards. And he made a, like, for example, he predicted in, uh, he wrote the age of spiritual machines in 1990 and predicted at that time that we would all be using wireless computers the way we are today. And at that time, there were only, you know, 2.6 million computers, and they were mostly academic and military applications. And uh, he predicted that there would be flying cars in 2023. And he partnered with Larry Page, again, CEO of uh, the parent company of Google, Alphabet, partnered with him and Boeing and Bell and said they could demonstrate the capacity by 2020 and that they would have aerial ride sharing fully operative by 2023. 
uh, and then Uber's head, Jeff Holden, he's, he's big in this also. And he said his goal was to make it economically irrational to own a car. Like that rang a bell. Klaus Schwab just said uh, recently from the World Economic uh, Forum, he said, you won't own anything and you'll love it. So we keep on hearing, okay, so we won't own anything and we'll love it, but who's going to own it? <laughs> who's owning it? They're not not owning it. Anyway, they say that by 2027, in just six years, you'll be able to order up an aerial ride uh, and, you know, get it an easy, as common as you would uh, today, and that you can do that by 2030. And I want to say that, you know, they actually just broke ground in the UK for the first airport for flying cars. They're kind of like from the Jetsons. And if you remember that, they're not big planes. They're just a few passengers uh, at a time. And again, they've partnered and figured out with FAA and all that for the regulations. But they're actually right on target for flying cars. So when you hear that these guys are... Um, making predictions it's it's actually very important to pay attention to them of course when you can create the future it's easier to predict it uh, so we've got extremely powerful forces on the planet making these predictions so um you know when i hear common words and concepts across the industry give your dna sample here your blood there your bio data here Ownership of data is never mentioned, but it's worth trillions of dollars in these markets and it's bio capital. So I just want to um, remind us to stay connected as we get into exploring this. And I, I know, so here I am getting emails from Diamandis by, um, in order to try to understand from him. And I just got one yesterday and it starts out, it says, Dear Kimberly, what if a microscopic robot could treat diseases from within your body? <laughs> what if? Uh, that's the vision of Bionaut Labs, an Israeli-based startup that represents the future of converging technologies that impact healthcare. He says, full disclosure, my venture fund Bold Capital is an investor in Bionaut Labs. Now, the advantage of all of this, I have to say, is this is a far fabulous place then to go, okay, bold capital. Who's in bold capital? What are they also associated with? This is the way to do the research and coming from the inside is a really useful tool. It turns out what I've been able to see from there is they have digital pills. It's a recent drug device combination developed to um, encapsulated medicine and modern monitor medical adherence. So you ingest mini sensors in the form of a pill and it's activated in the stomach and then it transmits the data to whether or not you took it and how it's working to either your smartphone or some other data portal. Now all this leads us to something called algorithms. And again, I'm just skirting across, uh, but I want to bring these certain concepts to bear because when it comes to health freedom, these are all critical things. An algorithm is a set of instructions designed to perform a certain task and it's key. It's underlying everything that reads your behavior and responds. So it's used in insurance. How do you qualify for insurance? There's an algorithm that does that. Employment, finance, education, criminal justice, uh, social services, all kinds of allocation of social resources uh, is based on data derived from the internet of body devices that are all algorithmically programmed. It's a math program. There are huge historical and institutional biases and in algorithms, the profiling and grouping that can happen based on inaccurate or incomplete data the lack of transparency, you don't know what the algorithm is, you only know the outcome. So you don't know the sources or the quality of the data used or who's creating them. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Weapons of Math Destruction that I'll also link to in the, in the show notes that really points out how significant algorithms are in our daily experience and certainly in any of these feedback technologies for our body.